Welcome to episode number 12 of Foreign Object. Foreign Object is the probe that explores America from the inside out. And today we are going deep, Voyager deep, deep into the cosmos and deep into the psyche of the quintessential American. This may come as a shock to my Australian, British and European audience, but America no longer has nice stuff. It was 45 years ago the US put a man on the moon. Now it can't even put a man on a high-speed train or an affordable electric car because fully one half of this country, the southern half in particular, long ago gave up moving forward along scientific and technological lines into the modern era. One half of this country is stuck in an 1860s time warp. Left to their own devices, this country music banjo-loving half would completely put an end to public education, the 40-hour work week, child labour laws, all the while doing everything they could to ensure corporations wouldn't have to worry about paying annoying taxes or having to deal with pesky big government penalising them for poisoning the water supply, polluting the skies or intoxicating our food. It's this half of the country that dominates the content of network and cable TV landscape. It's this half that devours evangelical documentaries, food shows that celebrate obesity and anything that looks remotely like Duck Dynasty. One woman, however, has stood in the way of this anti-intellectual half achieving their southern television utopia. Cara Vallo is the executive producer of the animated hit and my favourite comedy of all time, The Family Guy. This is a show that holds a mirror in front of America's face and says, see, you really are this fat and stupid. But Vallo isn't all mock and ridicule. She's way smarter than that. She's also the executive producer of 2014's breakout hit Cosmos, which educates like no other television program before it. Cosmos explains evolution, cosmology and climate change in a way that even my scientifically illiterate mind can understand. And with that, I'd like to welcome Cara to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. That was really, that was really good. <laughs> I'm going I'm to make a quick apology on your behalf. You've, uh, you've been battling for the last week uh, with a bronchitis-like flu, uh, flu, so so uh, feel free to cough when need be. <laughs> so. Thank you. I just want to make one correction. I'm not the executive producer on Cosmos. I am the um, I developed and produced the animation, okay. uh, which is about you know only about like thirty something percent of the. Uh, of the episodes, but okay, whatever. You got a big role anyway. <laughs> so, now, 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 a lot of people would be surprised, I guess, by uh, you know how fluky Hollywood is uh, and how fluky you know TV shows, whether it's reality or scripted, comes together. Now, I remember reading back, and if, if memory serves me correct, that Cosmos came about really by a chance, accidental meeting between Seth MacFarlane and Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, is that right? Yeah. I well, I'm not sure the timeline of the events I'm, I'm not sure if I think Seth had met um had known Anne Droyan prior to um meeting Neil I, I may be wrong but they had um they had a, a, a relationship for for a while like, they were both on the Bill Maher show together I remember and I think he had was in communication with Anne who is Carl Sagan's widow and the person who you know revived um the Cosmos series. So, and then I think there was a lunch with Neil where it Seth sort of put the pieces together in his in his mind. Okay, and and uh, have have you been surprised by you know the I mean what you guys are now up to eight million uh, uh, viewers per episode. I think mm-hmm. th- there's that the number. So, are you, are you surprised by the overall response? Um, the yeah, actually, I mean, I guess I guess I am. Um, it you, know, you just never know which way it's going to go, and um, you know, particularly with something like this, which is something that really hasn't been done in so long. I mean, it's been so long since the uh, since the original Cosmos, which was you know sort of a landmark. And a, I don't know, did 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 you? Watch the original Cosmos when it was on. Well, I think that was, it was on 1980, I believe, and I, I think it was shown in Australia like many, Are you many too years. Too young to have watched that. Oh, well, I was seven in 1980, uh-huh. so and I wasn't that, uh, too interested in science, in science at that age. Um, yeah, I was young too, but I um, it was one of those shows where you know that my parents sat us down and forced us to watch, um, and it was you know. It, it was it was really an event, and it was in, in the United States anyway. It was more than a a TV show. It really 
you know, it, it felt like something you were watching that had the power to change people for the better. And mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it was it, it was very difficult for me to decide um, to work on the show, actually, because um, when Seth, when they, Seth and Anna decided to make the narrative portions of the series, which in the original series were done with live actors and live action, re like historical recreations. Um, <clears throat> uh, because, you know, it was, it, it, it was such a huge um, show in, the, in, in this country and such a, like, seemed like such an enormous responsibility. Sure. Um, and I really didn't know how, how I could really do it justice and, it took a lot of um, uh, convincing um, for me to to sort of agree to even wrap my head around it and what it would be to try to reconceive what I remember um, being uh, live action scenarios. You know, actors in the you know 1980 with the fake mutton chops and <laughs> um, you know, and, and to be able to see it in my mind as something that could be animated, it, it just took a lot of um, a, a lot of trying to hash out. You know, because I really, it, I really didn't think I could do it. Could do the material justice, like the sheer scope and ambition of what I knew Cosmos to be was really daunting. Hmm. Um, you know, I think for most people in my generation, it was sort of Cosmos with the with Carl Sagan, sort of this mythic memory. And, you know, Carl Sagan's voice and him, like, you know, flatly stating that evolution was a fact in 1980 and the best available explanation of life on Earth. It just sort of rings in, in our memories. Yeah. I, if, 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 if science was, I mean, you know, I, I was hopeless at science. I mean, I, I fully accept evolution, always have, even, even from a kid. I fully accept climate change because I look at the experts and when they explain it to me in a simple way, I go, well, duh, it makes sense. And But, you know, I... You know, you, you say you felt like you had enormous responsibility in, in, in putting together this show. And, and when you consider that, you know, what's the recent polls show that, you know, more Americans believe in angels and demons and accept evolution and climate change, mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of blame that less on religion and more on a disparate educational system in America. You know, there's no edu national educational curriculum, yeah, curriculum like we have in other Western developed countries, and, and I, it's this broad scientific illiter illiteracy that kind of prevents America from dealing intelligently with yeah. its real, real crises. Do you feel like th this show, you know, the success of this show has kind of changed that a little bit? Um, you know, I'd like to believe it did or could. I mean, you know, th the sad fact is that we as a country here have fundamentally changed. I mean, you know, I mean, how do you really understand a person or a viewer or whoever you're trying to reach out to who thinks there's a you know, sufficient possibility of a zombie attack that <laughs> could warrant you know, a, purchase, a purchase of an arsenal? Yeah. You know, it's, um, I don't know, you know. It, what, what do you think, do you, do you, do you have a, a fear that maybe it was preaching, the show is preached to the converted a little bit? Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we were really trying to preach to anyone, and I don't think that was the um, the purpose of the original show either. I mean, um, it you know the creationists aren't probably interested in um, Giordano Bruno. You know, I I don't. I'm not saying it's it's you know it's for a, an elite audience because that's not the case at all, but. You know, it's 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 hard for me to wrap my head around what you said. Like the fifty percent of the people that don't believe in 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 evolution. I mean, I, I, perhaps I mean I um I live in a bubble. Um, and of course I'm I'm pr obviously you follow my Twitter account for me to what people are saying and thinking. You know, I I I read recently like a fervent twenty six percent of. Um, respondents to some polls say they have prayed for God to help their sports team. <laughs> yeah. um, and an equal number have like entertained the notion that their team is like quote cursed. Um, <laughs> That's where mine is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know, but it's, it's definitely, 
you know, you're correct. It's definitely part and parcel of our um, educational system that's sort of been chipped away at since, you know, Ronald Reagan was our president. And, you know, probably with a very specific purpose of our right now. Mm. Um, so I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't, um, it's hard for me to think that um, uh, it's a, like, reversible trend, you know, when you, like, see what, say, like, the Discovery Channel is now. Like, that was a network founded by the Department of Education to be, like, an informative and instructional network. And um, at one point, and airs, I don't know, I don't even know, I, the Swamp Brothers, you know, <laughs> yeah. storage locker, vultures, whatever. Doomsday preppers. <laughs> Doomsday preppers, I mean... Um, you know, those shows aren't working to save the planet. It's it's like, you know, it's interesting watching a, a network like Discovery, like, slide into that primordial ooze of television with, like, TLC and, you know, the toddlers and tiaras, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, that's so outwardly the base viewer's intelligence. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there are the times that they sort of blatantly flaunt like the pseudoscience supernatural crap that I mean that's the stuff that really offends me like the Bigfoot and the the ghost shows and all that shit like applying science to supernatural phenomena like that's terrible yeah you know and but that whole like trend in television like blending science and fantasy it's like suddenly this like mega successful formula and I mean I just like who, who is coughing up those shows like like well, literal like triglodytes in a boardroom, <laughs> Sabbath pelts. Like I just like what? Like who is coming up with those? Well, they're finding an audience. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's honestly, it seems like anything would find an audience. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I don't. I mean, we've we've gotten to such a point that um, you know, I think the best that we can sort of hope for the show like cosmos is to inspire people because it has been so successful and to inspire television people that, you know, something of this ilk could be popular as entertainment. You don't have to go to the lowest common denominator. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think we'll get to a point again where America doesn't need like fancy effects laden edutainment style of science presentation, you know, um, for a show to address like deeper issues, like, Hmm. how it is we think we know what we know, etc. Um, it's just easier to attack something that can be seen as overly technical. I mean, we're, you know, I think we, it, one of the, one of the bigger, biggest challenges that I faced in, in working on Cosmos was, you know, I was um, given the responsibility of explaining some very sort of complicated theories of science and experiments through, you know, somewhat rudimentary animation, um, and um, you know the 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 rest of the show was sort of you know had effects and CGI, and I had uh, you know, I was working with a digital animation format, and um, you know I, it was having to make something that was accessible and really understandable to people because. You know, if you give people simple logic that makes sense to follow, it's much harder to argue with. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a problem with science in the classroom. I mean, you know, in my opinion, is that it's so it's taught so dry. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, even I read somewhere that Dr. Tyson gave you know gives you a lot of credit in Cosmos for you know cr- creating what he said a graphic novel which interludes in which the his, with, you know with you know historical scientific figures and their struggles, mm-hmm. and you kind of bring that to life because people think in pic- pictures you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and science is so conceptual and abstract. And in my mind, I. I, you know, I'm, I'm good at, you know, I, you know, history and geopolitics and these type of things I can understand because it's not abstract. But as soon as you put a formula on a on a chalkboard, you've lost me. Uh, but when I watch Cosmos, you know, you've got animation and, and you bring yeah. these stories to life. That that's what makes it so easy to 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 understand. Yeah, you know, and it's um, people. You know, I think one of the reasons that science has sort of taken like a back burner to lots of other things is it's, um, you know, people like things that are easy for them to understand. Um, so, 
um, you know, making something as explainable as, you know, to the average viewer. I mean, that, that's sort of the part I enjoyed. I, I kind of like the, the um, assembly line aspect of that's sort of why I like working animation because you sort of, you create it like a sort of like assembly line in a sausage factory. And then um, if you have it, everything sort of set up the right way, it allows the, um, you know, the creative to be, to have much more freedom. So I, I, I feel like doing the, like doing the narrative part of Cosmos animation was tricky. And then the, the, what we call mini docs, the, the animated parts where we explain certain things was a sort of separate hurdle. Um, but I really enjoy doing those. Like, I, I feel like if, you know, the Obama administration had a department that just created like rudimentary animation explanations of things, whether it be like gerrymandering or, you know, the, uh, mm. um, it's anything Obama, you know, just any, yeah. It, it would, like, we had, when I was growing up, um, the Schoolhouse Rock animated segments, which um, networks actually just aired um, as, like, a favor to humanity. And it explained, um, you know, basic things of government, which people don't really know anymore, like the different branches of government and grammatical things, what's a verb and what's an adverb. And, you know, it's... People, people do. I mean, people need that kind of stuff, especially now. Well, a democracy is dependent on it, and you know, and as you said, what's that? In uh, sixty-four, as a poll, it's sixty-four <laughs> or sixty-two percent of Americans can't name all three branches of government. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not, I mean, it doesn't. It would have surprised me, like growing up, you know, in the seventies and eighties, but it doesn't um, doesn't surprise me now. You know, it's. It's, I mean, they're all around you. Well, and I think part of the problem too is is big money now. I, you know, um, Sheldon Wallen, who's a, a professor at Harvard, he talks about you know how America's become a totalitarian capitalist uh, society, and and everything is bought out. So, you know, you've got one half of the debate has been hijacked by big money. So when it comes to climate change, you know, you've got one half, you've got scientists explaining parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and then you've got big money spending on propaganda on diagrams saying, right. you know, it's bullshit. Um, no, I know. I mean, it's like during the, when the original Cosmos was on, I mean, it was so long ago, you know, it's 1980, but it was like, it, you know, it was it, growing up in this country then, like, that the climate was so different. Like, we had, so like, more money to throw at space stuff, and people were more optimistic and interested and less cynical. And, you know, now we have... A lot more access to a lot more information, obviously, but you know the people are imposing this willful ignorance on themselves and their kids, and you know either through ham-fisted, you know, religiousness or like shrieking about deficits. It's hmm. you know, and yeah, you know, that's I mean, it's it was it's all very um, it was it, it was built to be that way by you know people are made have been made to think a certain way, um, you know, and. Um, the original cosmos was science and space exploration and like the burgeoning growth of technology and the feeling that you know all this everything was about to open up and happen like sort of an open-ended view of the future and that was like something important like perfunctory even like the people um like people care more about like you know how technology can make life more fun or how can make their lives more, you know, meaningful and, or, and just uh, like caring about how technology came into existence. Like we have all this like amazing technology. Now, but I just don't think people stop and think or care to know how they got that, like how they got that iPhone in their hands. And, um, mm. you know, I, I don't know. It's like in 1980, we were you know, concerned with a, our concerns were different, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Like, there's a lot, there, the, the whole focus of the old cosmos was, you know, was completely different. The world leaders were more concerned with, like, you know, mutual yes. sure destruction. And so a lot of the focus has changed, but, you know, a lot of the old cosmos was a plea to humanity to just not blow itself off the planet before it could get into space. That's so radical. 
Yeah. <laughs> and now the new cosmos or what, you know, this past cosmos happened at a time when, like, a Kentucky Creation Museum, like, hosted a debate about evolution. And, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling. Well, as, as an Australian, I feel compelled to have to apologise for the, <laughs> the owner of that Creation Museum, as he is an Australian, Ken Ham. So, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> It's hard to believe, like, he's not an American, but... <laughs> I know. Hey, we, we've got our fair share of dimwits. Oh, so. don't know it. Yeah, you guys have like, your own problems. Yeah, yeah, we do. And I'll speak a little bit, I guess, about that. You, you bring, it raises a good point about the negative reaction to the show. And, and I guess... You know, <laughs> Specifically, that that white Christian fundamentalist uh, reaction, because there was a lot of ne- lot of negative reaction. I, I'll, I'll actually read you just uh, what one Fox News contributor had to. I mean, this is going not after even the show, but also after <coughs> specifically, you know, Dr. Tyson. He said, he said on Fox News, "I hate this guy. White liberal nerds." No, I saw that. Yeah, because white liberal nerds love this guy so much, he could defecate on them like Martin Bashir's fantasies. <laughs> Martin Bashir being the former MSNBC host, and yeah. they would dance in the street. All he does is he's drunk with adulation. I mean, that is just uh, <laughs> revolting. I know. There, there are no limits. Mm. There, are, there are no limits. It can't be shot. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's galling, and you just can't watch, watch it or read about it or, you know. I don't know. I mean, the there was um, the episode... Cosmos, um, that was pretty much devoted to the topic of evolution and um, the vast profusion of evidence, and especially genetic evidence, showing that is indeed the explanation behind behind all life on Earth. And um, this is the one that really made people go bonkers. So at one point, Neil just states plainly the theory of evolution, like the theory of gravity, is a scientific fact. Hmm. Um, and not surprisingly, you know, those deniers were not that happy with it. And, you know, their, but their principal lines of attack were like, and Ken, Ken Ham was one of them. Like, you know, he didn't like the, the idea of the Big Bang. Um, and he did that, you know, what the answer is in Genesis, the critique of Cosmos <laughs> specifically, like where he says, like, the Big Bang model is you know, unable to explain many scientific you know, observations, whatever. <clears throat> but, like, you know, that's not mentioned in the show. You know, it's like... <sighs> you know, I have a friend of mine, uh, Dan Arrell, he's a uh, columnist for uh, uh, Alternate, and and uh, he, he was, uh, you know, almost keeping, like, a journal of, of all the outrage on the Christian right. Every episode, I mean, there was... You know, yeah, they're putting out all the, you know, AIG, you know, which is a Christian right um, organization, constantly putting out um, material to refute what right. evident, you know, self evident, you know, scientific facts. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just mind, I mean, it's been mind fucked. It, it just is. I mean, you know, that now we, like, we see so called conservatives now as more inclined as the people who are more inclined to judge science based on like cognitive biases rather than a rational evaluation of the facts. Like even supposedly educated, you know, smart conservatives, you know, that are led by their like irrational brains into believing what sounds right. um, When told to them by these people, they trust like the people on Fox news and, you know, Glenn Beck said that, insisting science classes um, uh, should teach science is like, how did he say, like the Vatican suppression of Galileo <laughs> espousing the like, Copernican model, the solar system, or, 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 or something, something like that. I mean, it's about, you know, quote-unquote freedom. Like, you can't force things on Americans. And <laughs> government schools refusing to give equal time to creationists is, like, totally repressive. And, you know, in a few decades... When creation science finally disproves evol- you know, evolution, us libtards are gonna look like fucking tools. Like, just like, I mean, and for some reason, there's something about these people's voices or that puts them into some sort of state where they are believing these things that they, I don't think, like before Fox News, they would have believed. Well, I, I've always said this, that the reason liberals will never win is because liberals appeal to logic and conservatives appeal to emotion. Yeah. Um, they're able to base it uh, in simple reactionary slogans 
Um, you know, and any time you see a liberal debate, a conservative a liberal brings up, you know, a flip chart and a pie graph and all yeah. the statistical data, and uh, a conservative just says, oh, that's fuzzy math, and they win the debate. Um, Glenn Beck had that chalkboard or whiteboard or whatever that he scribbled on. Uh, yes. So it made it seem like he was doing a PowerPoint presentation for idiots. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, but, it's, but it goes back to, like, you know, we have an education system here that has systematically been turned to shit. Yeah. Um, you know, and there was a there was a time, and I I was very privileged to grow up and go to private schools and not be subject to it. But you know, when there was a time, even in the public system, when educating meant that students were able to call a call on like a modicum of critical thought to sift through what's partisan opinion and what's valued insight, and like the disjunction between. Um, our Americans like rising level of formal, formal education and their very shaky grasp on basic geography and science and history and grammar, whatever, and the you know that fusion of anti rationalism with anti you know intellectualism is you know it's going to reap what we sow at some point. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that you know again, I think like the main root of scientific ignorance lies in the fact that we just like can't enjoy things we aren't good at, you know, (laughs) rather than try to accept science, um, in our world, like we, you know, turn away like in distrust or frustration. And, um, you know, those people that refuse to allow opposing or alternative views, like they do it because they fear that the rational part of themselves or others may be won over by reason argument. I mean, I guess, I mean, it's like, you know, my my dad used to say, like, it's a sort of profound form of cynicism that um, he says, like, goes back to Watergate. Mm. You know? Like, since the 1970s or after the 70s, whatever, the rise of cynicism and applied to all things. This was, like, out of our control, like, starting with politics and Nixon, who I like to blame for a lot of it. And Well, even, even, uh, even the assassination of JFK, even people go back a little bit earlier and they say the assassination of JFK and the... And what was a bungled, you know, investigation, what seemed to be, you know, from the outside looking in a bungled investigation, that really eroded Americans' faith in, uh, in government. Um, but up until that stage, Americans kind of, you know, it, no matter your political views, there were some things which, you know, you, you believed in big government, you, you, you believed in the government uh, right. that was doing the best that they could for the people, blah, blah. But from that point on, conspiracy theories, you know... Uh, re- that, I mean, you feel that, like, I mean, I... I wasn't around then, but I feel like even there was still sort of a sense of innocence about politics and the government, even through those assassinations of that, like, that people maybe did believe back when it happened that, the you know, the way it happened. Mm-hmm. And maybe it was sort of, you know, it was years sort of afterwards, you know, and when we were, when we had gone through Watergate where we just saw it, you know, with our own eyes, how corrupt and criminal politicians can be, you know, I mean, um, you know, it's like the, the rise of, I don't know, just like, it, it seems like that, that cynic, the political cynicism has sort of spread to any subject yeah. in which we have to rely on those who are experts to dumb down for us. You know, <laughs> people don't want, you know, just don't want to admit that they, can't possibly know or understand everything as well as other people or smarter people, like experts, quote unquote, and they're you know, not willing to trust the motives of anyone with more knowledge than themselves. Well, it, it, yeah, that's, that pseudo expert uh, analysis, you know, whenever there's a terrorist attack in, in, in the Middle East or even in Europe. And they'll bring on four white Christians to talk about the despair of, you know, mm-hmm. the terrorists. I mean, yeah, that's that that's really going to enlighten me on on the experience of these people living in, you know, occupied Gaza or, or uh, you know, in countries we've invaded and bombed. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like that segment, of, that particular segment of the population that's watching that particular news source is, you know, I, I feel, I feel like they're um, they're comforted. By fact, by facts, just like that, they want. That's who they want to hear it from. I mean, it's like a supporting you know, narrative, yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, it's there. They feel very uncomfortable in this new world, and you know, and it, it, I feel like you know, it's almost. 
there's I, mean, I feel like this started I think with Sarah Palin um like that that year like she sort of ushered in what's kind of like a joyous celebratory quality to stupidness <laughs> like all of a sudden like it's just in your face like it, it's you know, pride in being dumb yeah and it you know, and I, I I sort of think she started that like I don't think there'd be a duck dynasty without her I mean it's like the problem with you know is with those damn elites not with us yeah. Um, you know, and like you and I, we probably still, I know I still take joy in learning new things and, you know, moreover, as sort of a solace in realizing that there are things that I'll never be able to wrap my head around and plenty of subjects that I will never master, but someone else can and will, like, thank God. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and you're right with the Sarah Palin, that anti-intellectual movement it's almost become. And, you know, these politicians get away with just saying, oh, climate change, I'm not a scientist, man. Um, and yeah. it becomes an acceptable, acceptable uh, dismissal of the subjects. And I'm not a scientist. Man is now just been um, appointed to like a, a Senate subcommittee on like, uh, sub- uh, Jim Inhofe. Yeah, Jim Inhofe. No, the, um, didn't Marco Rubio say that I'm a scientist, man? Yeah, well, I think he, he, he said that specifically. But yeah, yeah the man. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so we're, we're, I, 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 we're, we're almost running out of time, but I, you know, I have to talk to you about Family Guy. I had, I've got more questions <laughs> I want to ask you about about uh, Cosmos, but uh, I want to, you know, I want to, a lot of my listeners are, you know, are big fans of Family Guy as well. It's my favourite TV comedy of all time. I'm not just saying that to blow sunshine up your backside, but <laughs> it, I mean, it really is. This is a, you know, a show which, you know, uh, every, you push the envelope, um, and you know, the jokes are so rich. They work on so many levels and in most cases, you know, are so far from the obvious. And, you know, you've done jokes on abortion. You routinely do jokes about pedophilia. Uh, in one episode, you had the family dog, Brian, simulating ejaculation on the baby's face, Dewey, with sunscreen, and you even did a satire of 9-11. Now, talk me through, you know, as, as, as best you can, the writing process for, for each episode. How do you bring all of those ideas together for a 23-minute episode? Um... Well, I am um, I am not one of the writers in the show, so I'm not responsible for um, any of those wonderful things that you decided. Yep. Um, but we have a you know a large team of writers that um, collectively um, pitch ideas for stories, and then um, who just like pitch jokes constantly all day long. You know, there's what a job. Thing people, yeah. I mean, you know, I think it sounds more. I think it's much more difficult than you can imagine, right? Um, you know, cause it, if you look at other television comedies, they aren't Family Guy, um, and they don't have that level of um, sort of satiric uh, that you know, where Family Guy is able to satirize things, but in such a clever way that. It's not. I mean, I know a lot of people find a lot of a lot of it offensive, but the um, the, jo- the thing like what we make fun of, like nine eleven, or the thing about Osama bin Laden, you know, with the doing his um, outtakes. Yep. Um, <laughs> not. It doesn't. It's funny enough and done in sort of a clever enough way that it's it's okay, you know. Um, and I think it's a really difficult process to get to get there. And it's you know, Seth McFarlane who created the show. It's um, I'd known him before he created Family Guy, and he just has a um, you know a special gift. And he's he's got a lot of talents and gifts. But one of one of them is uh, which translated into Family Guy is his ability to pull that kind of stuff off. Mm. Um, and. How much hate mail do you receive then for a um, reaction? You no, know, there's a box of mail there. It's not, not, not a lot. I mean, the the serious ones I think go directly to the lot. We're off the lot, um, and you know the the most occasionally we'll get a call, like a hate caller, but it's it's more um, the the we'll get a a you know sanctioned response occasionally from like the parent television council or whatever 
um, if there's something that's really offensive. But, you know, I, people are too lazy to sit down and actually write letters. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, there's not there, – there are a lot of, like I, – I think the biggest criticism um, is just com- – like, if you I, – I don't really read them, but on online, on blogs, where they're um, – um, where people are free to be vicious with anonymity. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it, it's been, you know, it's a fun does, show does, to make. Does, does Seth have the kind of the, you know, the, the final say, you know, the, I guess the final veto on what he believes is, uh, acceptable joke humor or, t- yes. or too far, right? Yeah, yeah, no, he, he does. And, um, he's got a very, good meter as to if something is um going to play in the right way or be like he's he's really masterful at knowing what um like he'll he'll um uh defend certain episodes and certain gags um to the death as being not offensive like if you on paper they would seem offensive you know maybe the abortion show is a good example of it it's just not or or the episode where we had where Fox News, like Sarah Palin, sort of called us out for making fun of people with Down syndrome because we had a character with Down syndrome on show, and it's, you know, without watching it, yeah, maybe you would think it would be offensive. If you watch a show, it's just not. It's done in a way, and it's not offensive. Mm. Um, and there's not really any criticism, and there's no argument you could throw at me to prove otherwise. Well, and, would you do a joke about Muhammad, a sketch? Um... You mean like depicting him? I, I no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's something that not just we haven't, you know. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I, we we've done plenty of jokes about Muslims and about Jesus, obviously as a recurring character. Hmm. But you know, I, I, yeah. I mean, I shouldn't say no. I, I, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know what. Um, it seems like, um, you know corporations and studios and stuff are are playing a role in in whether that you can do that or not now i don't know yeah i I think it's challenging to tackle um because it's very hard to do you know even i saw that you know the um charlie hebdo brought out their new cover (laughs) of the magazine and you know i've you know i think blasphemy is ridiculous obviously it's a victimless client a crime i'm a non-believer but I'm also sensitive to the fact that these cartoons are also, you know, latently racist by, you know, using the big nose, um, you know. So it's very hard. To, if you're going to if you're going to portray Mahabund, you got to portray a stereotypically Arab-looking person, and it's hard to then cro- you cross over into dangerous, you know, where it becomes a racist joke in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm not that familiar with um, with their with the magazine, but I know that they. You know, they take a lot of criticism. They really do push. I mean, I I, I think it's been. Um, I, I think Europe has had a much, uh, well, obviously had a much longer sort of history um, with political satire, and it makes Family Guy seem like nothing. I mean, you know that um, Europe has always been at war with cartoonists, right? I mean. Satire, satire has always been a dangerous form of art, and over the last centuries, like European political cartoonists have faced, you know, prison and censorship and death threats, and kept making them. I mean, the business of breaking taboos is, you know, it's a risky one, right? Like, I mean, well, the, the Nazis used cartoons to dehumanize yeah. the Jews. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And then you know there were, um, you know, there are. Um, Oh, in the, you know, particularly, I guess, in the 19th century, probably before that, but there are, like, um, like William Hogarth and Daumier, like, political satirists who also made, like, you know, art, pure art of a singularly, you know, haunting nature and, like, um, you know, and commenting on political events. Like, Daumier, like, was a, he would, that's like, he was like a news person. Like, he would comment on political events in France through his cartoons and, you know, in Paris, the arist- aristocratic ruling class wasn't laughing. <laughs> no, the, the publishers were, like, tried for treason, and he was thrown in jail, and he kept on coming out with his cartoons, you know. Um, um, 
it's, you know, the 19th century was like the golden age of satire and, and satirical magazine, political magazines in Europe. And, um, uh, you know, what is this, James Gilray, like, was a political cartoonist, like the late 18th century London. And, like, at a time of, like, roiling, like, social and political unrest and change. And, you know, his, dad, his, his cartoons and stuff were, like, you know, like licentious and like corrupt, but like, you know, amazingly open to freedom. Go ahead. Uh, you know, it's like satire is only as admirable as it as its motivation, right? Like if if it's if you're not funny when you got to you have to question the intent and um, you know, destroy. We strive to be funny without putting people down and. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's given that, well, you know, we'll always be judged by the company we keep and what we do. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's a, it's sort of a thin line and a, a line that needs to be crossed at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But like, as you said, you're offended by, you know, those, the cart, you know, the depictions of Jews and I'm sure um, there are plenty of people who are completely offended by the, the cartoons of like, you know, Jesus with Jesus flying out of like a nun's vagina or whatever. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a risky business and it's, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't like the first, um, of its kind. It's the first, like, you know, massacre, I guess. I mean, obviously in modern age, but you know, that, yeah. The attack was like devastatingly effective. It's like the terrorists objected to jokes about their religion, so they killed them. You mm. know, now no one's laughing. <laughs> yeah. Um. You know, and like somber demonstrations don't defeat the assault on free speech. You know, it's you know the comedy, the aspect of it is you know killed with um you know the collective horror at by executing cartoonists. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, I, I, the, the reverberations from this, I don't think we've even fully realised yeah. yet, you know, how far they're going to travel. But, uh, Cara, you, you've been an absolute trooper. Um, <laughs> I can still hear that you're, you're not fully recuperated. And, uh, and again, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, this has been uh, very enlightening. Uh, you've struggled through illness. Now, you, you're, um, Twitter, is that, that's the best place for, uh, for my listeners to find you? Yeah, you can either search it under my name or my handle is actually um, at Teenage Sleuth, which is my production company. And you, that's also your blog, right? You're very uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what my blog address is, but it's, <laughs> um, te- it's a, the name of it is Teen Sleuth. It's a WordPress um, blog that I haven't been um, updating as much as I ought to. Uh, you, I, I read your uh, your your. Your post at Christmas time, and it was around about the time Sarah Palin said something stupid about the war <laughs> on Christmas. <laughs> and yeah. you, you said, Go, Sarah. Everybody knows that Christmas is a totally real, not made up by Hallmark holiday. Jesus was born on December 25th, <laughs> year zero, and there were pine trees and holly and eggnog and snow in the Middle East. <laughs> For some yeah. reason, while blonde haired, blue eyed English speaking shepherds carried AR 15s and Santa blessed everything, and lo, it became fact. <laughs> I always have to, you know, I, I never want to actually give Sarah Palin any typing time because, you know, it, that's what fuels her, but it's, it's... But it makes you feel good. It's just too, when she comes out with a Christmas book about the war on Christmas, it's just like... Yeah, and then, then she kicks her dog. <laughs> yeah, right, she stands on her dog to get the peanut butter. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'll, I'll let you get some uh, uh, honey-scented uh, tea. And, Thank you uh, very much. Yeah, and thanks again, Cara. Sure. Love talking to I'll, you. I'll see you on the Twitter. Yeah, we'll do. Sit down. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.